Shoe manufacturing was the main industry in Newburyport for the better part of a century, employing thousands, sustaining the local economy, and populating the downtown with four and five story factories. By the 1850s, shoemakers were sprouting up in Newburyport like dandelions. Robert Couch Jr. and company made children's shoes and slippers for five years, employing 150 and boasting a payroll of five to six hundred dollars a week. Jacob T. Rowe employed 25 hands and generated revenues of $20,000. That's $612,000 today. Seth Chase made soles and other shoe parts in a facility on Prince Place, where one of the largest shoe factories in Newburyport would soon rise. The factory still stands today, but exchanged its roots for other industries after shoemaking disappeared, and today houses million-dollar condominiums. Until the Civil War, shoes were crude, straight, and presumably terribly uncomfortable by today's standards. Left and right shoes eventually caught on with men's and then women's as styles and advanced manufacturing methods gained in importance. Mass production of shoes and boots didn't begin in earnest until the soon to be preeminent Dodge shoemaking family came to town, led by Elisha Perkins Dodge. Elisha saw the future and began what was soon to be mass production of shoes. Born October 5, 1847 in Ipswich, Elisha, at age 16, followed brothers Nathan D., John L., my great-great-grandfather, and Moses to Troy, New York and started out as a survey assistant for the Catskills and Schenectady Railroad. According to Nathan D. Withington in the 1903 biography about Elisha, after a year on the railroad, he joined his brothers as a shoe cutter. Brothers John L. and Nathan D. wanted to start manufacturing in Lynn, Massachusetts, where they briefly operated on a small scale. Given that lenders were more accommodating in Newburyport, the brothers moved here in 1866. On September 1, 1866, N.D. Dodge went into partnership with John H. Balch and established the business over the First National Bank, their creditor. Elisha working on salary as a cutter. He was remarkably quick and expert, and it is told of him that he in three hours cut 60 pairs of Balmorals. He also did a large share of the bookkeeping, Nathan attending to the selling, wrote Withington. Elisha was off and running. In late 1867, he took over the business with partner Newell Danforth. With some ups and downs, the business took off with various partners taken to the business until 1875, when Henry B. Little was brought in as partner until 1899. Elisha controlled the business and its offshoots under various names such as E.P. Dodge and Company, New Report Shoe Company, and N.D. Dodge and Bliss. By 1880, Dodge and his brother Nathan owned the largest shoe factory in the world, according to the New Report News. Between 1873 and 1902, the year of his death, his company racked up more than $30 million in sales of women's shoes. That's $825 million today. His large factory at 21 Pleasant Street hummed with machinery, including the revolutionary McKay Stitcher, which could turn out 200 pairs of shoes a day, and as it was refined by United Shoe Machinery, 1,200 pairs a day by 1960 according to the paper Cordwainer, that's a shoemaker, delivered by Milton L. Dodge on April 4, 1961, to the Tuesday Night Club, a group of prominent male news reporters who met every other week to eat, drink, and discuss the issues of the day. Milton was John L.'s grandson and my grandfather. He was awarded numerous patents following his passion for inventing machines rather than manufacturing shoes. By 1874, six boot and shoe manufacturers were operating in New Report, with the Dodgers joined by E.K. Batchelder at 314 High Street, John D. Pike at 268 High, Jacob T. Rowe at 285 and a half High Street, and W.N. Spinney at 10 Middle Street. The number grew to nine by 1884 and 1885, and there were 11 boot and shoe makers suggesting handmade footwear was still viable. Cottage industries were starting to spring up under the directory headings boot and shoe machinery and boot and shoe stock, according to the new report directories issued annually. 
The late 1800s and the early 20th century constituted the golden age of local shoe manufacturing startups, according to the Massachusetts History of Industries 1930 edition. At its peak, shoe concerns in Newburyport employed upward of 3,000 operatives, as the Massachusetts History of Industries called workers. Many of the operatives were French Canadians who had left the farms in Quebec to work in the textile mills and shoe factories of Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Working in the shoe factories was a major upgrade to their lowly status in the pecking order of America's newly arrived inhabitants. Indeed, few could speak English, which put them at a disadvantage to, say, the Irish, who were more inclined to make demands on their new report shoe bosses. Here's a rundown of a few of those bosses. Bliss and Perry was incorporated in 1892 by Charles A. Bliss and Nathan D. Dodge. Walter I. Perry was shortly thereafter brought into the business. It became Dodge Bliss and Perry in 1907 and was known for an inexpensive line of women's slippers and eventually women's shoes. Others associated with the firm were George H. Bliss, Donald I. Perry, Herbert E. Harriman, and Norman P. Merrill. It employed 400 at its peak. Daniel S. Burley and William R. Usher started their namesake firm in 1891. Eight years later, it became Burley and Stevens. In April 1894, Harry M. Husk Company started up and eventually employed 400 operatives. In 1906, George A. Leonard began operation as a partnership with Roger Sherman Jr. and Andrew Rofe. Leonard eventually took over the business with 350 operatives, turning out 2,500 pairs of shoes a day. Smaller concerns include the Baby Shoe Company, owned by John S. Norton and Louis J. Festo, made soft-soled shoes for infants. The Custom Heel Company employed 50 operatives with J. F. Pollard as president. The Maplewood Heel Company produced, unsurprisingly, heels. The president was Fred W. Mears and treasurer was Halsey E. Abbey. The Fern Company, with Oscar Fern as president, made women's shoes and employed 175 to 200 operatives. Fern and Poor employed 125 and made women's shoes. W. D. Hanna employed 300 in the production of shoes. Lowell Thomas Shoe Company made women's shoes with Harry B. Thomas as president. William P. Lowell Sr. as treasurer, and William Lowell Jr. as secretary. The R.E. Welch Shoe Company, owned by Richard E. Welch, employed 75. These companies required skilled and unskilled laborers, and the Franco-Americans gladly fulfilled that need. The major immigration of Franco-Americans dovetailed with the rise of the shoe industry in Newburyport. And I quote, Many young Frenchmen and women would come south by rail to work in the mills, earn cash, and sometimes return to the family farm in summer. It was said that they were seeking streets paved with gold. Many stayed. The French were slower to assimilate in New Report society than the Irish because they continued to speak French at work and in their social lives. Franco-Americans were active in French societies, but most were not politically prominent, according to a 2014 article in the New Report News by Dyke Hendrickson who also wrote Quiet Presence, a book about Franco-Americans assimilating into American society. As the 19th century wound down, the shoe industry kept right on growing with nine manufacturers, three of them Dodge concerns. Dodge Brothers at 112 Merrimack, E.P. Dodge at 21 Pleasant Street, and N.D. Dodge and Bliss Company on Tracy Place. A whopping 21 boots and shoemakers made the 1894-95 directory, although it's not precisely clear what distinguished a maker from a manufacturer. Either way, shoe entrepreneurs were setting up everywhere in Newburyport. In 1891, John L. Dodge died, but sons Chauncey and Harry carried on the business and had started the Dodge Brothers in 1888. It became a large maker of lady shoes and slippers well into the 1920s and possibly into the 30s until a strike in 1933 crippled the shoe industry. The Dodge brothers filed for bankruptcy at some point, but when is unclear. Unfortunately, many of those records were discarded when my grandfather's house on Toppins Lane was sold in 1978. 
The Dodge Company specialized in women's and children's shoes and slippers, although detailed information about the styles is somewhat hard to come by. But here's a little bit. Showing the style of the day, an ad for the Plaza Pump in 1919 edition of the Sunshine News displayed a picture of a sharp-toed and bejeweled lady shoe with high heels. The ad from the Sunshine Factory of the Nathan D. Dodge Shoe Company crowed, Our Plaza Pump was successfully displayed at the Milwaukee-style show. It was called the real hit of the show. Clearly, the shoes were stylish, as workers would complain during the 1933 strike, that constantly changing novelty shoes required considerable extra work, deserving of higher pay. According to the Newburyport News, on August 8, 1891, as excerpted by former Newburyport Public Library employee Ron Irving, and I quote, Nathan D. Dodge and Son was manufacturing plain slippers to be sold at 74 cents to $1.50 and Oxfords to be sold for $1 to $3, as well as manufacturing Theo Ties, Grecians, Elites, Baden Badens, Elysians, and others in ooze, which is a type of leather, cloth, bronze, and satins. Irving excerpted many years of the news and the Herald concerning the Dodge Enterprisers. They covered strikes, fires, accidents, layoffs, and the politically active Elisha. The news reported on April 29, 1895, E.P. Dodge to use lasting machines. New methods displaces 15 men. Perhaps given their national market, primarily in the East and Midwest, very few shoe manufacturers bought ads in the directories, where some description of their products might be present. In perusing 10 directories between 1874 and 1942, I discovered one Nathan D. Dodge ad pushing its fine slippers in its retail store at 71 and a half State Street, and one from Burley and Stevens advertising its Goodyear rubber soles and McKay Stitch specialties. Elisha died just shy of his 55th birthday from pneumonia on September 30, 1902. Author and Newburyport historian John J. Currier, who lavishly eulogized him at his memorial service, summed up the father of shoe manufacturing in his tome, History of Newburyport, 1764-1905. I quote, For 35 years, Mr. Dodge was interested in establishing and developing the shoe industry in Newburyport. He was one of the first to combine the many parts of shoe manufacturing under one roof and under one management and the care of one man. Others who follow owe much to the example set by him as one of the pioneers in the manufacture of shoes on a large scale. Post E.P. Dodge, the shoe industry in Newburyport had yet to hit stride. There were 12 boot and shoe manufacturers in the 1904-05 directory, 17 boot and shoe makers, two heel makers, and two counter makers. One of them was Bracket Heel, whose nameplate today adorns the front entrance to the large Prince Place factory built by Nathan D. and Elisha Dodge. The handsome brick building presently houses million dollar condominiums. At its peak, the complex of factories anchored by 21 Pleasant Street and the Prince Place factory and bounded by Tracy Place, Prince Place, and Hales Court employed as many as 1,500 workers in 1919, the complex, or at least 117,000 square feet of it, was sold by the E.P. Dodge Trust to shoe manufacturer W.D. Hanna. Add in the Dodge Brothers, who started up on Merrimack Street, and the number of Dodge employees rises to nearly 2,000. If the numbers of listings is any indication, the shoe industry in Newburyport peaked in 1914 and 15, with 15 shoe manufacturers and seven heel, counters, trimmings, and remnant manufacturers. Subsequently, the Dodge Brothers, according to my 85-year-old uncle, made army belts, canteen holsters, and possibly other stitched goods for the World War I effort. By 1924, the shoe industry and in revenue was in decline, according to an industrial survey conducted by the New Report News to attract commerce to New Report. Indeed, Shoe revenues had dropped from 8.39 million in 1919 to 5.9 million in 1924. During the same period, capital invested was almost halved. Wages paid out declined less precipitously from 1.78 million to 1.54 million. According to the survey, and I quote, 
Newburyport specializes in women's turn shoes. The shoe trade looks to Newburyport for the latest style ideas. Frequently, 10 to 15,000 pairs of shoes are shipped out of the city each day, end quote. Indeed, shoe revenues in Newburyport in 1924 would double all the other industries combined in the city, which the survey dubbed the gateway to the north. More alarming, Newburyport economically was headed down. Industrial revenues declined from $20.6 million in 1919 to $11.99 million by 1924. During that period, a recession had taken hold as the economy transitioned from wartime to peacetime. Still, 15 manufacturers and five heel and counter concerns soldiered on. The survey of might not have been the last word on the local shoe industry's health in the 1920s. According to the 1930 Massachusetts History of Industries, Newburyport shoe revenues rebounded to $7.9 million in 1927, with 60 shoe-related firms operating in the city, many more than were ever listed in the annual directories. Even so, the die had been cast. If the decline had not already begun, it would soon, and some of the wounds were self-inflicted. The Dodge Brothers, according to my uncle, failed to embrace adhesives and instead stuck, pun intended, with more expensive stitching. Styles changed rapidly, influenced heavily in the 20s by the discovery of King Tut's tomb in 1922. Tut mania was all the rage in glamorous Egyptian styles for women. And strikes didn't help. Major blows in 1933 and 1934 just about finished off the booming shoe industry in Newburyport. Workers, numbering 1,500 from seven Newburyport factories, struck on March 10, 1933, according to W. Lloyd Warner's The Social System of the Modern Factory. In the throes of the Depression, annual wages had dropped from $1,332 a year to $924. Workers also spent time in factories with no pay as they waited for orders to materialize. The workers were represented by a loosely knit union which after a month of striking won recognition and some wage increases. The workers, 40% of them women, returned to work on Monday, April 9th, jubilant that they had prevailed, but at what cost? Nine manufacturers, a heel and a pattern company were still listed as operating in the city in the 1935-36 directory. But by 1942, the number of manufacturers had dwindled to two and one supplier concern. The big names, Dodge, Brackett, Hanna, Bliss, Learned, and Perry were gone. New report shoe industry was dying. The other big blow came on May 19, 1934, when a suspected firebug, as they were called in those days, lit up the Dodge Brothers factory at 112 Merrimack Street. The building was a total loss, as was the George A. Learned Company factory next door, then occupied by the Fisher Shoe Company. The blaze destroyed 20 buildings, including many nearby homes. The area looked like a war zone and attracted 125,000 gawkers in the days that followed according to a 2009 story in the New Report News. Consider that nine out of 10 families in New Report had a member working in the shoe factories, according to a 2012 New Report News article by the late historian John Legoulis. The fire threw 500 workers out on the street. The firebug was never caught, although it's reasonable to suspect that the arsonist may have harbored resentment from the strike 13 months prior. The fire signaled that this once vibrant industry was flaming out. By the time my grandfather wrote his Cordwainer paper in 1960, two shoe manufacturers were still hanging on a new report. The irony is that Massachusetts still produced more shoes than any other U.S. state. And I quote from his paper, Massachusetts in 1959 led the nation with approximately 102,500,000 pairs of shoes made an increase of 6.7% over 1958. Maine retained fifth place in production, while New Hampshire was sixth. New England during 1959 made 250 million pairs and accounted for a third of the entire national production, he wrote. Strikes, fires, competition, and technology shifts hastened the end of shoe manufacturing in Newburyport, but its demise was inevitable. New England's claim to shoemaking primacy in 1960 is but a memory for the few who care. 
capitalism ran its course in shoemaking, as it has in many U.S. industries during the past half centuries. TVs, computers, autos, steels, and appliances, to name a few. Learning the lessons of its past is instructive, but can't reverse the ravages of competition. This long ago and often overlooked chapter in New Report's history spawned innovation and acrimony, created wealth for a precious few, and defined the local social strata. Next time you walk past the impressive edifice that is 21 Pleasant Street or the Bracket Hill condos on Prince Place, imagine the sounds and smells coming through the open windows a century ago on a hot July day. That was the shoe industry of Newport. In the beginning, the French were satisfied with the salaries they received when they arrived in Newburyport. The shoe factory owners found them to be hard workers and in most cases were not as prone as the Irish were to stir up trouble, especially over unions. The French were more docile and pleased with what they had in contrast to what they had had in Canada. They were more willing to send their children to work than others were. For all these reasons, they kept more to themselves and concentrated on the needs of their church. Employers preferred them to the other, more demanding groups. The workers were always concerned about their jobs. The workers' fears that machines would eliminate jobs were not unfounded. From the Herald, September 7, 1886, a new shaving machine in the M.D. Dodge factory saves the labor of six men. From the Daily News on April 29, 1895, quote, E.P. Dodge to use lasting machines. New method displaces 15 men. The rapidity of style changes in shoes, especially women's shoes, necessitated speed in manufacturing and a ready adaptability to change. This resulted in rush jobs and long layoff periods causing instability of employment in the shoe shops. An item in the Daily News on August 1st, 1902, described some of the changes. Women's Oxford shoes were being made with Louis XV heels and ties. Hose was initiated. Tie shoes were growing in popularity over button shoes. By 1902, the craze for Louis XV heels had begun to abate. They had reached a height of three inches. Cuban heels were also high. Health addicts decried the use of high heels, but fashion dictated the demand, and high heels remained in demand. An article in the news on April 28, 1902, showed how important shoes were to the well-dressed man Quote, no well-dressed man would dream of wearing a pair of shoes not made to order at $15 to $18 a pair and has trees for every pair. His shoes are never polished but boned. A man who leads an active social life can spend $750 a year on shoes. Given a multiplier for inflation of about 18 times, the shoes would cost $275 to $325 a pair in 1995 dollars, and the total annual expenditure would be over $13,000 in 95 dollars. By 1908, the younger set was wearing velvet socks with tan shoes. Fashion became harmful in 1911 when women's shoes made of the breast feathers of hummingbirds became the latest fad. One can only imagine how many hummingbirds would have to be slaughtered to cover the feet of a woman. In December of 1908, a letter to the editor of the news strongly asserted the right of men to organize a union without interference from the employer. He claimed that the management of the Dodge Brothers Company and B.E. Coal Company intimidated employees by firing them because of their membership in a union. Practices such as these impeded events by the workers to unionize the shops. A strike at the George Learned Company in 1913 began when the company refused to accede to demands of the unions that they discharge non-union members. 
A party of 10 Italians arrived to take the Greek strikers' places at the Learned Company. Manufacturers often exacerbated inter-ethnic hostilities by using strike breakers of a different ethnic background. On August 25, 1914, the news reported that 60 lasters went out on strike at the Learned Company rather than work under a Greek foreman. Workers at Bliss and Company went on strike in 1916, claiming that they were discriminated against because of their ethnicity. A conference was called in which they were promised equal treatment. Differences in language, culture, and religion are counted for some of the tensions prevalent in that period. It would take time, but by mid-century, much of this had passed and most were integrated into the community. In addition to functioning as workplaces, factories often served as social venues. In March of 1920, through the courtesy of Superintendent Amesworth, the Question Club was formed by 10 men at the Hannah Shoe Factory to discuss questions related to civic history, the duties, the privileges, and the rights of citizenship, and current events. The Question Club met at 4.45 to 5.45 Monday and Thursday afternoons. In addition, most factories sponsored sports teams, dances, and held an annual summer day at the beach with free refreshments. As time went on, however, when jobs were not as available and a second generation had arrived, they began to realize that they might have to take a more active role in the regulation of salaries and physical conditions in the shoe factories. Interviews with Newbury porters whose lives were linked to the shoe shops illustrate the need for a change. Donald Shampoo. My father worked in the shoe shops while I was growing up. I can't say anything good about them. Not only was the pay low, but there was no security to the job. You worked three months, had three months off, worked another three, and then was out of work again. It was all tied up with seasonal orders for shoes. When he was laid off, my father worked at any job he could find, such as delivering milk, selling insurance, etc. My uncle worked for Swift & Company, and every Saturday, he dropped off five pounds of Hamburg with us, pretending it was extra that they had. We ate that, a family of six, for the whole week. Hazel Cody was 96 years old when Tom Horth and Jean Doyle interviewed her several years ago. She worked at most of the shops at one time or another. She worked at the Dodge Shoe Company before the fire. When the strike came, she went to Haverhill to work. Quote, I worked five and one half days and made $12. When working, no talking was allowed. You were allowed to go to the bathroom once. You could be fired for even a minor offense. Once I spilled some cleaning fluid on my stockings. Not wanting to spoil them, I washed them in the sink and hung them out on the windowsill to dry. My supervisor was walking by and saw them. She fired me on the spot. Shoe shops worked six months a year. I could charge groceries at Schwartz's store on Orange Street. I paid it back when I worked. Bill Plant, former editor of the Daily News, had many stories about the shoe shops. As a boy, he often walked the picket lines with his mother. Quote, my mother was working at the Sunshine Factory on Monroe Street one afternoon when the foreman came in to tell the women that they had received a rush order. Everyone could go home at 5 p.m., but had to be back by 6 p.m. The doors would be locked at that time. Anyone not there would be fired the next day. My mother was just a few minutes late, but the doors were locked. She saw that a man was working in the boiler room in the cellar and tapped on the window. He had no way of letting her in by the door, but he let her go in through the window and she was able to retain her position. In a presentation to the Monday Evening Club, May 14, 1992, Bill Plant told how at age 33, his mother, fed up with the ill treatment she and her fellow workers were getting from management at Bill Dodge's Sunshine Shoe Factory, 
and from what the women called, quote, fresh behavior of male supervisors and bellboys. She marched the women out the door, down High Street to City Hall, and formed the women's local of the shoe workers union. She was elected president. Addressing the group, Bill Plant said, quote, I report this because it helped shape my early appreciation for the social and political problems attending women's issues in our unfolding society. At age 12, I walked picket lines with her. At age 14, I helped her at weekly whist parties at the Union Hall, one of the means of raising funds to support union activities. For some, a major grievance was low wages. Bessie Jones, wife of Sam, a shoe worker, said, quote, wages are awful now. When a girl two years ago would be earning 25 a week, nowadays she's lucky if she gets 10. I know lots of girls who only get four. People are lucky if they only get 10 cents an hour. If a girl is living with her family, it's not so bad. She can get along. But when girls are alone, I don't see how they live. They are forcing our young women into immorality. This last accusation was aimed toward one particular foreign factory owner who forced, under threat of job loss, some of the girls into giving him sexual favors. All this made the workers ready for the strike that broke out the following spring. Yankee City had had periodic strikes of shoe operatives in previous years, but there had never been a permanent union in the community. One former Yankee City shoe manufacturer explained that when organizers came down and talked to some of his workers, he had immediately offered raises and contracts to his workers because he thought that unions were a, quote, bad thing. Most of his workers signed the contract and declined to unionize. One reason why unions had not been successful was that the South Enders, who were so numerous among the workers, would not join. They would rather have steady work all the time and not fight. This was particularly true of the French workers. But finally, even they began to listen. Small merchants were sympathetic to the workers for two reasons. They too were lower and lower middle class people, interested in the welfare of others of comparable social status. They sold their merchandise almost exclusively to members of the working class and they had to show sympathy for them to keep their trade. During the 1930s, Lloyd Warner and his associates compiled a six-volume set of books entitled the Yankee City Series that dealt with the cultural, social, and economic status of Newburyport during the 1930s and 1940s. Volume five concerned itself with the social organization of a modern factory. The authors selected the strike of 1933 to show the crisis that existed in the relations of management and workers. Warner described the scene as follows, quote, on a cold March day in the worst year of the depression, all the workers in all of the factories of the principal industry of Yankee City walked out. They struck with little or no warning struck with such impact that all the factories closed and no worker remained at his bench. Management had said their workers would never strike because the workers of Yankee City were sensible and dependable and had proved by a long peaceful history that they would always stay on the job. Union men outside the city said the Yankee City workers would not strike because Yankee City had never been and could not be organized and therefore the shoe workers of Yankee City were obstinate and, quote, always stupid enough to play management games. Most of the townspeople said workers would never strike, but foreigners and Yankees of 10 generations, men and women, very old and very young, Jews and Gentiles, Catholics and Protestants, the whole heterogeneous mass of workers left their benches, and in a few hours wiped out most of the basic production from which Yankee City earned its living. Not only did they strike and soundly defeat management, 
but they organized themselves, joined an industrial union, and became some of its strongest members. The strike began on March 10 and lasted until April 6. The battle was fought between the owners of seven factories and 1,500 workers. The mayor, who was Gaydon Morrill at the time, granted the strikers free use of City Hall for their meetings. This was a surprising turn of events for Gaydon Morrill. He was a former shoe manufacturing plant owner and a member of the elite upper class in the city. Throughout the strike, the mayor had tried to be neutral. After further negotiations, the manufacturers accepted the union and the strikers accepted arbitration by the state board on the matter of wages. Both sides claimed victory, but the prevailing opinion was that labor came out on top. As conditions improved in the industry, the influence of the union declined. The union did, however, perform an effective service. It demanded adherence to regular working hours and it helped maintain established rates of pay and equalization of the pay of different workers in the slacker periods. In 1997, in the North Shore magazine, Bill Plant recalled his days in the shoe shop, quote, it is the summer of 1939 and I am up on the second floor pulling shoe lasts for 25 cents an hour minimum wage which I cannot break because it's the best I can do is two cents an hour at nine cents a case. I put my hand down into the bin to grab a last and came up with a broken Coke bottle sticking in the palm. So I pull it out, use a handkerchief for a wrap and walk into the office to quit. The minimum wage law passed by Congress in 1938 was welcomed by the shoe workers. From now on, they would get at least 35 cents an hour. This was in sharp contrast to what some workers had been receiving. Massachusetts dropped from 47% of U.S. shoe production in 1899 to 17% in 1948. In 1919, there were 114,000 shoe workers in New England. By 1948, that figure was down to 79,000. Production continued to fluctuate in the coming years, not until the latter half of the century would the shoe industry disappear entirely from Newburyport. As the years passed, the concept of the French parochial school gradually became obsolete. Children no longer wanted to use their parents' language and preferred the public school. Probably hastened by the end of World War II, the tight French community gradually dispersed, moving out of the South and, as second- and third-generation family members, moved away from their original neighborhoods and married into other ethnic groups or into other religious affiliations. The original reasons for the establishment of St. Louis disappeared. The congregation contracted slowly, although those that stayed were faithful and loyal to its ongoing tradition. In the 70s, the French-speaking Mass at 1015 ended. Father Dacia began a restoration fund that was continued in the 80s with the removal of the front building to Liberty Street and construction of a front entrance. A new pipe organ was installed as the restorations continued. In 1995, the church celebrated its 90th anniversary with William Plant, as the main speaker. The words on the bulletin said it all. Let us gather as God's family and rejoice in this joyous celebration. Despite their hard work, it was obvious that the end was in sight. In 1997, one pastor was named for both parishes, and on January 1, 1999, St. Louis Parish reunited with the Immaculate Conception Parish. The reason for its closing was that vocational callings had diminished. Many fewer men and women were deciding to devote their lives to the church. The result was a severe shortage of priests and nuns. Priests that were available were slated for larger churches. Economic pressures on the greater church demanded reduction of church buildings. 
Thus, after close to 100 years of service, St. Louis de Gonzaga closed its doors, leaving a void that for many would never be forgotten. I interviewed Ellen Maku O'Keefe at that time when she spoke of what this loss meant to her. Although she married an Irishman, she stayed at St. Louis all her life, contributing financially and participating in all the spiritual as well as money-making activities. Her parting words summed up her failings. It has been a tough year. I lost my husband, my mother, and several aunts. When I finally began to sit back and collect my thoughts, I realized that in truth, I lost all my family when the French church closed. These were the people I had associate, associated most closely with all these years. I saw the same people in church on Sunday. We served on committees together or sang in the choir. Now it has all changed. We have no committees. Some of the people have gone to other churches. I have nothing against the Immaculate Conception Church. They have tried to make us feel welcome, but it isn't the same. I feel sad every time I think of what I have lost. Most important, however, to our story was the ability of these par parishioners to not only keep their faith, but also play an important part in the development of Newport. William Plant was the epitome of that person. Having worked his way up from reporter to executive editor and general manager of the Daily News, he set an example for others to follow. Among his many accomplishments were his drive to save and revitalize downtown Newburyport and his taking on the leadership of the group that created the Industrial Green. He was an advocate of a free press and known as one who went out of his way to help others climb the ladder to success. Time does not allow us to name all that found success, but the following played a part. Norman Jutras, who started out as a manager of Grant's store in Newburyport and went on to build his own appliance store in Seabrook. Dr. Arthur Pluff, a tentist who along with his wife Annetta played a leading role in many community affairs. James Crodo, who served as a city councillor for five terms from 1958 to 1967. Boot Chenard, who went on to Boston College and later served as a high school coach in Salem and Newburyport. Boots, having lived into his 90s, reminds us of the past through his many articles in the Daily News. Marshal Joseph Garand of the Newburyport Police Department. Ben Benoit Richard, Department Fire Chief and owner of Richard's Garage. Robert Sharon, who, after attending a mission at the French church, gave his life the next day on the Thresher submarine as it plunged to its depths on April 10, 1963. Our heart goes out to all who lost their church. We welcome those who left Canada and made their homes in Newburyport. Their presence and the others who have followed have helped make Newburyport what it is today.